Thank you very much. <coughs> An idiot's guide. So it's not that you're the idiot, I'm the idiot. Um, and I would just like to say I deeply sympathize with all of your knees because I know if I was sitting down there, they would be talking to me. I'll try and make this brief, inshallah. Abdurrahman sprung this one on me. You know, the, the one on music, I did some research. I found the sound clips I wanted. I thought about it. And then he said, oh, hey, can you do this one? <laughs> Introduction to Sufism. <laughs> so um, I was going to tell a story about a guy called Dave. But I figured you would realize that I was probably talking about myself. So I'm going to ditch that. And I'm going to tell you a story that is actually about me. Um, but I'm going to give you a couple of quotes about Sufism. There's, you know, in the generation immediately after the Prophet Muhammad, one of the great saints of the time said, Sufism was a reality without a name. And it has become a name without a reality. So even back then, they saw that it was not necessarily anything separate from all the basic profound elements of Islam, of being pure and standing before your Lord and praying and all the other elements that are part of Islam. But I want to give you some quotes. The, these are different quotes that the Sufis often use. And one of them, this one is from the Prophet Muhammad, who said, man is asleep, and when he dies, he wakes up. So die before you die. There is also another statement that said, he who knows himself knows his Lord. You know, the Arabic tasawuf or, 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 or Sufism, as, it, as in English, also has a name of ilman nafs, and it means, that means the science of the self. So Sufism, in that respect, is a science of the self. And I, you know, I come from a family. My father was a Freudian psychologist. My mother was a child psychologist. I, uh, I know a bit about the sciences of the self. Um, we, I used to hear it kind of over the scrambled eggs at breakfast time. They used to discuss the patients that they were seeing without actually mentioning anybody's names. There's also, there, there's a certain, that we have in Islam, we have revelation, which are directly the words of God that came through the angel Gabriel. We have other things called hadith that are sayings of the prophet that have all been collected, books and volumes and volumes of them. And we have another thing in between, which is what they call a hadith qudsi. It's God speaking on the tongue of the prophet, but it's not revelation one of those just kind of in between and one of them is the words of God saying I am in my slave's opinion of me I am in my slave's opinion of me and another one the same it says the heavens and the earth do not contain me meaning God God saying the heavens and the earth do not contain me but the heart of the believing person contains me so just to give you a grasp of the kind of paradoxes that we're also kind of dealing with and one of the great saints of, of Morocco, who passed away around 40 years ago, and many of his devotional poems are still sung by many people now across the world. In one of his poems, he said, existence is meaning set up as forms. So the forms of existence, all the phenomena of existence that we see, are actually meaning. They represent meaning, but they exist as forms. So, you know, there are many books on Sufism, but... I read a, one of the great ones that I struggled through. It was this thick, and I got three quarters of the way through, and the author said, well, actually, there's no knowledge in books, <laughs> which, which I, I felt he could have put in the preface. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm not going to do any more quotes. I'm going to tell you a story, and this was about me. Um, I left school in 1967. I was absolutely, totally uninterested in going to university. It just sounded like more school. Um, and it was 1967. And so I did as little work as possible in order to get money so that I could travel and have different experiences. And if any of you were around in the late 60s and early 70s, you'll know what kind of experiences I was trying to get. And I did. And unlike President Clinton, I inhaled. And at a certain point, it's around 1971, I realized that in order to make sense of my life, I needed to live a simpler life. You know, the Buddhists say, before enlightenment, chopping wood and carrying water. After enlightenment, chopping wood and carrying water. 
I wanted to chop wood and carry water. I was serious. Someone said, I, once, I told someone, you know, I was really a hippie. They said, what kind of hippie were you? I said, I was hardcore. And we, I went to the southwest of Ireland where I found there were a lot of other people like me who wanted to get out of England because it was too built up and structured and all the empty houses in Wales and Scotland belonged to people from Birmingham and Manchester. Um, so you couldn't rent them anyway. And I got to Southwest Ireland. You could rent a house for a pound a week. You could buy a cottage and an acre for a thousand pounds. This was in 1971. So I stayed. And I stayed. I met a righteous woman. We were serious. We had a daughter who was born at home. Up, up in the mountain, the last house up the track in the mountains, we had no running water or electricity. And uh, I had a, later had a son who was born under similar circumstances. Altogether, we spent around seven years living without electricity and running water. We were hardcore. But on one of those, you know, something we experienced while we were there, you know, I, I, I as a sort of, let's say, like a leftover from, from, the, from the psychedelic times, I understood that existence was one. This idea of, like, existence is a unified, harmonious event. I understood that but I didn't have any sense of where I fit into it. If that's true, it's all one, well then who the hell am I? You know, because I'm not you, you're not him, and he's not her. So there's a separateness, but yet there's a sense of just this unified nature of existence was something that I understood. But I realized I needed a way to worship, and I also felt, you know, there were many of us living out there and we'd get together, and, you know, cut the hay, work on the vegetable gardens, mend the houses, the women would get together, be with the kids. And then we'd all go back home to our own homes and we realized it was much better when we were all together. So we would discuss, look, you could sell your place, you could say we put all our money together and we could buy a big place and we could all live together. And we all liked that idea, except someone would say, well, what do we base it on? You know, how do I know you're not going to steal my stuff or make a pass at my wife or because all those things went on, we, we knew all of that. Um, so there was this kind of huge question being like, how to worship and what is the nature of, what is a pattern for social interaction? Anyway, at one point I made a trip over to England because there was an old friend of mine who I'd been in touch with, I hadn't been in England in years. He said, look, I got two houses to decorate, they're back to back, big London houses. It's gonna take me two months, why don't you come and do some work? and uh, you can make a bit of money. So I went over from, you know, County Cork and left no electricity or running water and suddenly I arrived in northwest London. Um, and I knocked on his door and he said, by the way, I should tell you a couple of days ago I became Muslim. I'm like, okay, Just cool, whatever. And, uh, but what was interesting was that, you know, I remembered him and he was kind of different. And then some of the other people from the community that he knew also came and a couple of guys came and worked on the job that we were working on. And they would have these discussions about these trips that they'd made to Morocco and this extraordinary old, you know, these old men who were like sort of biblical saints, you know, out of the Old Testament, these kind of people who really are not alive anymore. You won't find people like that almost in the world today. Um, and they would recount these stories. And I was like, man, I really want to go to Morocco because this sounds so amazing. And they said, well, you know, you could go to Morocco, but most of you just find there's a few old men. You know, the old Sheikh is there. He passed away several years ago. And we're, in one way, we're sort of like his inheritors. And whatever you see here that attracts you, or whatever you feel about him that attracts you, is the same thing here that you maybe find attractive. And I, I was intrigued by them, and I was intrigued by the qualities that they had, and the discussions around... Sufism and all these things and living a life of meaning was very appealing to me. And so when we finished the work, I went up to Norwich, which was the city where they were based. Whoa, it's really happening out there. In Islam, we say there's an an the angels come with every drop. There are angels with every drop of rain. Anyway, I went up and I went to stay with one of the guys that I knew from London. He said, oh, when well, you come to Norwich, come stay in my house. So I went to stay in his house and I met all these people that you know, some would have been my friends anyway, because I just liked them, and others I maybe wouldn't have done, but I, I felt an interesting kind of common, a kind of common bond with them, and a kind of respect for them because of what they'd taken on. They were, you know, doing the ritual ablution that Abraham was talking about. They were doing five prayers. They were fasting Ramadan. They were studying. 
And there was a kind of kinship among them that I really found impressive. And I, you know, I thought, well, something about this has got to be too good to be true. So I, let me dig a little deeper and then I'll find something that I think isn't true and that'll maybe be my way out. Um, because if I go too far into this, I'm going to end up having to do ritual ablutions and praying five times a day. And there was a part of me that really didn't want that at all. Um, and so I, I stayed one day, two days, three, four, five days I was there, I think. And then one day I said to the guy whose house that I was staying in, um, look, is there anything I can do to help? You know, I'm handy with a paintbrush. And he said, well, yeah, there's the downstairs toilet. It'd be really great if you could paint it. And there's paint here and a brush. And if you could just do that, that would be really be fantastic. And look, we're going to go out, but it's fine. You can just be here and just paint, and we'll be a couple hours, and then we'll be back. So I started painting, and I was painting away, painting the house. And I'm, you know, how we, if you paint, you think. So man, I was there. I was painting and thinking, and I was thinking, ooh, you know, this is really amazing. But you know, if if I stay here. You know, I'm going to have to do this because it really feels to me like I believe this is true. And I was, you know, you know, the ego, the ego does not want to be trapped. My ego does not want to do five prayers a day. My ego does not want to fast from dawn till dusk one month of the year for the rest of my life. But I knew that if, that if this came upon me, this was going to be a major commitment. But I'm painting, painting, painting. And I'm thinking, you know what? Everybody's out. I got my bag here. I could get my stuff. I can get myself, I can jump on the train. No one's even going to know I'm gone. And while I'm thinking that, I'm painting the ceiling and there's two live wires sticking out of the thing and I touched them with my hand. I fell off the, fell off, I was standing on the toilet. I fell off the toilet. Fortunately, I missed the paint pot, but I landed on the floor. Paintbrush went sideways. I landed on the floor and as I took in that moment, I realized that my quest for knowledge and my search for all of these things had actually arrived at a doorway that I had already gone through. I'd already thought that this was true. So the only way out was to pretend that I didn't believe it. And that actually was not an option. And it was in that moment that I really realized that the meaning, the root meaning of Islam, my timer is telling me that I'm done and I am pretty much, the root meaning of Islam was salam is the same word. And Arabic has these three-letter roots with most of the language, which is what makes it very kind of deep and with lots of layers of meaning. One of the profound roots of, of, of salam or Islam is surrender. And I realized submission is actually the nature of the game because I had an idea of how I wanted things to be. And then I was submitting to the way that I felt things actually were. And I think in that moment, the realization of an inward map that had a journey for my own inner enlightenment, let's say, was the same map that I could get for social justice as was so eloquently described just now by Ramona Ali. And that was, I think, the moment when I actually encountered the reality of Sufism. Because suddenly the form was the meaning. And there was no way that I could walk away from it. And that is the idiot's guide to Sufism. And all I can say is who but an idiot would stick his hand in a live socket. <laughs>